So moving forward, we're going to start talking about the globalization of silver. Now, <clears throat> in order for Europeans to make the inroads that they made in the Indian Ocean and the spice trade, um, some form of readily available currency had to become open to them. Um, European demand for Asian products, for the most part, is limited by their ability to pay. Um, European goods are not of the same quality as Indian and Chinese products. Um, also, European trade goods are not in any kind of high demand in Asian markets. So Europeans were required to pay in either gold or silver. <clears throat> and Europe itself had very few sources of precious metals, uh, with the exception of lots of lead and lots of iron ore. <clears throat> now, all of this kind of falls directly into place when in the 1530s, massive deposits of silver are discovered in the Americas, specifically in the Andes in South America. Um, one particular mine in modern day Bolivia known as Potosi becomes the largest, densest source of silver discovered in all of human history. Okay. And the mine at Potosi becomes the largest, richest industrial operation in the world at the time. And pretty soon what ends up happening is that you have dirt cheap silver which is cheap because all of the labor used to extricate it, mine it, process it, and ship it is Native American slave labor. Um, and this cheap silver begins flowing into Spain via Mexico and South America, and this gives European merchants the buying power that they have been lacking in the Indian Ocean and in Asian markets. Now, coincidentally, at the same time, much to Spain and Western Europe's delight, the demand for silver in the 1500s increases exponentially because the Qing dynasty changes their tax collection system and they pass into law requiring that all citizens pay their taxes in silver going forward. So not only have the Spanish discovered the richest silver deposits on earth, but coincidentally, within about 20 years time, the demand for that silver skyrockets. So <clears throat> at this point, massive shipments of silver start flowing in through the Americas, through Europe and Spain, or across the Pacific to the Spanish colony in the Philippines. And at almost the exact same time, huge silver deposits are discovered in Japan. So the supply increases even more. So this map kind of gives you an idea of exactly how South American silver becomes basically the worldwide currency. Um, the silver is mined in South America and then shipped north to Mexico. And then from Mexico, it's shipped either across the Atlantic directly to Spain, where it circulates through Europe and then makes its way around the southern tip of Africa into the Indian Ocean. Or... The opposite direction, it crosses the Pacific in what becomes known as the Silver Vein and lands in the Philippines, where the Spanish use the silver to buy um, cheap, high-quality goods directly from China. But either way, silver becomes essentially the universal currency. It's accepted anywhere in the world by anyone because of its exponential value. Now, this is a drawing of the mines at Potosi. Uh, again, this is a, um, this is a, you know, crude native settlement early on. But once, um, once silver is discovered, an entire city basically springs up from nothing surrounding this mountain. Um, within a couple of years, the city grows to this you know, hold about 40 to 45,000 people. And all of this is based on silver. Uh, this is like the gold mining towns of the old West in the United States. Basically towns spring up out of nowhere for absolutely zero reason. And then once, you know, the gold runs out, the towns basically vanish. 
Now, in the case of Potosi, um, that mine is still in use today in 2017. So there's still a a uh, pretty sizable city surrounding it. Um, but once that silver runs out, just like in the Old West, and Potosi probably will essentially become a ghost town. Now, <clears throat> thanks to the readily available sources and thanks to the Chinese demand, uh, the value of silver jumps exponentially. European merchants, and especially the Spanish crown, who is able to tax the movement of silver in and out of its colonies, becomes wildly, wildly wealthy. Um, for the Spanish, this means more colonial expansion. This means massive investments into their military. They begin funding aggressive religious expansion and missionary work in India, Africa, and in Asia, mainly done by the Jesuits, who are kind of the um, the uber conservative, uber aggressive, aggressive, the uber aggressive Catholic order in Spain. Um, the Spanish silver dollar, known as the real, or also called the piece of eight becomes essentially universal currency. It's accepted in all markets and basically every um, populated part of the world. And the flow of silver to Spain is so extensive that in the long run, it actually is negative. It actually has negative effects on the Spanish economy because as the silver starts to build up and accumulate, um, inflation sets in, which drives the value of it down. Also, thanks to the fact that cheap Asian goods of higher quality are making their way into Spain very easily now, uh, the domestic industry, the homegrown businesses in Spain, suffer greatly because they're unable to compete with the price or the quality of goods from China or India. So here you have a Spanish real from the 1600s. Um, you can see on both sides, it's marked with the flag of Spain, as well as the family crest of the royal house. Um, again, in the case of Spain and Portugal, all of their colonization and all of their trade is either sponsored or directly monitored by the government. So even commercial enterprises, like the one at Potosi, are all under the direct management of the royals. Now, on the other side of the world, in China, the discovery of silver is a huge boom for their economy. Um, there is essentially a constant stream of silver flowing in from the Americas and Japan. This funds massive economic expansion in China. Uh, there is a huge specialization in labor because since taxes can no longer be paid in goods like rice or silk or textiles, workers have to be able to sell something. Um, so one of the thing, one of the side effects of this globalized silver trade is that there is a huge movement towards private business in China and family farms and subsistence farming declines pretty dramatically. Um, also, cheap Chinese goods are now flowing to markets essentially all over the world. Um, rather than just being confined to the Indian Ocean and to Central Asia along the Silk Road, China explodes economically. Now their products make their way to massive populations in Europe. Their silks can be found all over the Americas. And this again, exponentially increases the economic output of China. Now, unfortunately, again, just like in Spain, silver has some negative side effects in the long term. Um, eventually, China will face the same inflation problems as Spain did, as more and more silver flows into the country. Also, as subsistence farming declines, deforestation and soil erosion become major problems because more land is being cleared in order for farmers to switch their production to cash crops. And that becomes a serious environmental concern for the Chinese. Not to mention the fact that the decline in subsistence farming 
also puts a lot of pressure on the food um, popular, not the food population, but the food sources in China. And with that decline in subsistence farming, there are periodic famines and food shortages within the Qing dynasty. And this is only mitigated by the fact that the potato arrives in China from the Americas in the late 1500s. And because the potato grows more easily and with less labor and also has more calories than the rice being grown in China, are Chinese is the Chinese government able to maintain and stabilize the food sources and continue population growth in China.